Good morning and welcome again to Blantyre Road. Before I introduce the Reverend David Doyle, for the last time, for the moment anyway, um, I'll cover the safety precautions for anyone who may not have joined with us before. So please keep face coverings on throughout the service. As loud singing is not yet permitted, we unfortunately we have to sing silently. Please remain seated after the service until instructed to exit and please refrain from gathering in groups outside the building. I'd like to say one or two words before I hand you over to David. When we considered reopening Blantyre Road as lockdown eased and we were permitted to do so, the Kirk Session did not take the decision to reopen lightly, more especially because we had not long become vacant and we were a little apprehensive, to say the least. However, having had the Reverend David Doyle lead us in worship over the last three weeks, I believe I speak for the Kirk Session and the congregation that we have had our fears relieved somewhat, and we can now look forward to whatever God has in store for us. On behalf of the congregation, I would like to thank David for taking time out of his well-deserved retirement plans to lead us through Easter and into spring. We wish you and your family a happy, healthy retirement, and may all your plans that you have had to put on hold come to fruition. We would be delighted to welcome you back any time, although you may not recognise most of us by then, as by that time we should have been able to source a hairdresser and an appointment for a haircut. Thanks again, David, and we wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's been good to be here to get back into a pulpit and to come to a congregation where virtually every seat is occupied. That's remarkable and something that hasn't happened to me very often during the course of nearly 40 years of ministry. Not often is a church almost full to its capacity. There's one seat in the middle. I don't know whether that's the cutty stool or whatever they used to call it. Somebody who's stepped out of line but has decided not to turn up today. But apart from that, it's great to see just about every seat occupied. And I wish you well. To be vacant at this stage in history is not the easiest thing in the world. But I wish you well and I hope the future uh, unfolds. I'm sure it will. Under God's purposes, you will find a role as Blantyre Old Parish Church, serving as I'm sure you always have done the parish that in which you are set. I wish you every blessing in the future. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Christ is risen. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. On this first day of the week, let us worship God. We sing the ancient Greek hymn. You won't be singing in Greek, but nobody will know today anyway. I'll tell you what the Greek word is. Anastasios Hemera is the first line of the hymn we will sing. The day of resurrection. Hymn 413. Sing it in Greek or in English. Sing it in your heart. Somebody up the stairs switched up. There it was back again.
Now let the heavens be joyful and earth her song begin. The round world keep high triumph and all that is therein. Let all things seen and unseen their notes of gladness blend. For Christ the Lord has risen, our joy that has no end. It's been said that on this Sunday, this Sunday after Easter, God really knows who his faithful people are. The special services, the distinctive, colorful atmosphere of the usual celebrations of the Easter period are past. The day of palms, the moving events of Holy Week are over. The alleluias of the day of resurrection are sung with perhaps a little less vigor. Inevitably, it seems to be part of our human makeup that the Sunday after Easter should have a somewhat flat feeling about it. We call it Low Sunday. And though we hardly know precisely what that term means, it's reasonable to assume that it refers to the low which often follows the high of the Easter festival. This sense of passing from a high to a low is in fact exactly the opposite of the movement in the New Testament. The Gospels rather tell of a growing excitement, a rising enthusiasm, an increasing appreciation of the amazing truth of the resurrection, a deepening understanding of its transforming power. For the disciples and the friends of Jesus, each week, even each day, brought new confirmation of the Easter event, a new awareness of the presence of the risen Christ. And each Sunday, the first day of every new week, became a celebration of resurrection. A day in which to rejoice. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Wake us, Lord God, today, on this first day of the week. To rejoice in your resurrection power in Jesus Christ. Arouse us by the light of the Easter gospel. To see the signs of his living presence among us. For we come to you from a world where so much concerns us. Even frightens us. Where so much is happening. Which makes us weary and worn and sad and angry and bitter. Insecure and uncertain where hatred and greed make for violence and grief, where rampant illness and suffering and loss bring a sense of meaninglessness and sorrow. We come here to seek renewed hope, to find your peace. Father God, we are often faithless creatures. We hardly believe your promises, we are too readily reduced to despondency. Too easily we reach the point of thinking there is little future for us. We become victims of doubt and fearfulness. Yet there is still our faith that Christ is alive, that he lives with us, and that we will live with him. We have faith. Forgive us. And help us where it falls short. Help us to trust ourselves and those whom we love. And those from whom our help can never be sufficient. To your deep peace. And to your undefeated love. 
which we have seen in Jesus Christ our Lord. So wake us and arouse us to Christ's presence with us and his peace upholding and surrounding us. Give us hope and joy in the triumph of his suffering love. Then send us back to the things of this world, forgiven and renewed to live as those born into a new and living hope and into an inheritance which nothing can destroy or spoil or wither, kept for us eternally in Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. We pray in his name and we pray together in his word. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Listen now to the word of God. We read two passages today from John's Gospel. The first, John chapter 14, which takes us to the upper room and the days of what we now call Holy Week. John chapter 14, and we read from verse 23. Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him and will come to him, and we will make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the counsel of my name will teach you all things. I have said to you, peace. I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. You heard me say I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me but the world must learn that I love the Father and I do, that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Amen. And again from the 20th chapter of John's Gospel, the account of Easter evening. John 20 at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you and after he said this he showed them his hands and his side the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord again Jesus said peace be with you as the Father has sent me I am sending you and with that he breathed on them and said receive the Holy Spirit 
If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Amen. And thanks be to God for his word to us. Him 431. Hymn 431. Again, an ancient hymn of the church. A Latin hymn. I'll not bother you with the Latin, but this one you can sing in Latin or in English in your hearts. And we sing just a few verses of the hymn. The first four and the ninth verse. We'll not sing all nine verses. Verses 1 to 4 and verse 9. O sons and daughters, let us sing. Alleluia. Alleluia. sons and daughters let us sing the king of heaven the glorious king o'er death today rose triumphing alleluia alleluia That night, the apostles met in fear. Among them came their Lord most dear and said, My peace be on all here. Let me take you to a small room, an upstairs room, and in it perhaps ten men, maybe a few others as well. It's unlit except for a solitary candle. The doors are locked and barred. It's dark outside and too much light might attract unwanted attention. These ten, ten maybe fifteen, cower together, hiding from the authorities. For their leader has been done away with. And they're afraid they might share his fate. They're talking, but the conversation is dead. They've hardly any heart left. During the last 48 hours or so, 
They've lost all hope of answers. Life has been reduced to a heap of inexplicable puzzles. They're in a state of short grief, mourning the loss of one who had held their lives together. And now, just as they were beginning to accept that death as real, they're confused by reports that their women folk have seen him alive. They could hardly believe he'd gone. How could they begin to believe that he had returned? Their whole grasp on reality seemed under strain. And then without their noticing, somehow he arrived or came in. He's there, sitting among them, almost as if nothing had happened. But of course, hardly nothing. For the reports of John's gospel go out of their way, uncharacteristically, to emphasize his hands and his sides, still clearly bearing the marks of cruel and violent torture. Yes, it's Jesus, certainly Jesus, real there in the flesh. That report of Mary Magdalene discarded as hysterically imagined as utter nonsense. That report is true. He's alive, risen. And then they remember, just as he said he would do. There must have been silence. There's no recorded response from the disciples, not even from Peter who had a habit of blurting out words even when silence was called for. How did this new reality begin to sink in? Peter and James and John and the rest must have had so many questions burning within them. And yet something about Jesus makes them hold back. So this silent stillness holds. And then Jesus speaks. And yet... These very first words of his, the first addressed to his disciples, stunned by his death and stunned by his reappearance. These first words do not on the face of it contain any theological profundity or any momentous significance. Nothing about his death or the meaning of the cross or what the New Testament calls resurrection. Shalom, he says. Peace, just the simple, standard Jewish greeting. Shalom, peace be with you. For shalom was and still is the conventional, conventional way in which Hebrew speakers greet one another. It's used variously to mean hello or cheerio or good morning or good evening, used regularly. And this was the greeting which Jesus offered to his bewildered disciples. Shalom. It's almost as if all he said to them was good evening. But if Jesus and his disciples had been English speakers, and if his first word of address had been a good evening to you, then surely these words would never have been uttered again in a merely everyday significant way so shalom is taken by Jesus and utterly transformed for his followers because of the resurrection the disciples are offered the gift of peace his peace perfect peace the peace that drives away fear to this cowering fearful little band of hiding disciples this peace was offered and offered again a week later in that same upstairs room for the peace which Jesus brought to his disciples in his resurrection the peace he offers to us is not something cheap or cozy or comfortable neither was it for him maybe in that same upper room these same disciples recalled the words he'd spoken round the supper table in the hours before his arrest. Peace is my parting gift 
to you. My own peace such as the world cannot give. It was a strange gift coming then in promise at least from a man who stood in the midst of severe tension on that Mon Monday Thursday outside that upper room there was the growing flood of opposition which would pound the very life out of Jesus inside the room a growing fearfulness that would lead to betrayal and denial and desertion yet here was this master speaking of peace was in that peace which as yet the disciples could not share that he went from that room to arrest and trial and crucifixion and death did they recall these words echoed in this first risen greeting to them peace be with you as he showed them the hands that had been pierced and his side struck by a Roman lance. Did they begin to recognize that this peace, this peace with God and with each other, promised and again and again offered by the risen Christ, had cost everything to achieve? In his resurrection is our peace. Not only because of his suffering on the cross. The peace is not something cheap or cozy or comfortable. It costs. Someone pointed out there are two kinds of peace. First, the negative peace of detachment that simply means the cessation of all conflict and the end of all striving. You can find a simile in the scum-covered waters of a swamp, a solitary place overwhelmed by a deadly calm, a sinister place savoring of rottenness and death like the peace the world gives then there's an active and dynamic peace like that of an electric power station where giant transformers carry millions of volts and maintain a steady tension in stillness this is the peace that lives in continuous tension with the world holding in control tremendous forces the peace which cannot which can exist amid persecution and humiliation and death a peace which still keeps us inwardly strong this is the peace which Christ knew and which he gives there's nothing cheap or cozy or comfortable about it certainly not for Jesus himself nor for his followers for once he'd shown them his hands and his side he repeats his greeting shalom peace be with you and he adds as the father sent me I send you the peace which Jesus brings to his disciples is no mere absence of conflict with an internal possession which we hug to ourselves. It's not the sterile calm of a stagnant pool. Rather, it's only as they allow themselves to be sent out by Jesus, to stand for him, to witness to him, in the midst of challenges and tensions, only then does this peace truly become theirs. It's the paradox of the gospel. That only as we give do we really receive. Only as we obey that we find freedom. Hans Lilje, the Norwegian bishop, took his stand 80 years ago perhaps in speaking out and acting against the evils of Hitler's Third Reich. On behalf of those he served and in the name of Christ, Miraculously, it seems, he did survive and later wrote about his experiences in a Nazi concentration camp. He writes these words. In those days, it was granted to me to tread the shores of that land which lie on the outermost fringe of time, a 
upon which already something of the radiance of the other world is shining. I did not know that an existence which is still earthly and human could be so open to the world of God. It was a stillness full of blessing, a solitude over which God brooded, an imprisonment blessed by God himself. This is the peace Christ had promised on Monday, Thursday in the upper room. A gift confirmed in that same room on the evening of the day of resurrection. Peace with God. Peace with one another. A peace found through faithfulness. Faithfulness to Christ. As he indeed is faithful to his people. In obedience to Christ. As he was obedient to the point of death. We can live in a new order of life where there's no room for fear. The peace of the resurrection can be ours. The peace which sustained the Apostle Paul when finally he came to Rome, the destination of his missionary journey. But he arrived in chains, yet still convinced of the purposes of God. While his jailer looked on, to the Philippian church facing trials of their own he wrote the peace of God which goes beyond our human understanding will keep guard over your hearts and minds in Christ here's the conviction learned from Christ's cross and resurrection that he's in God's hands forever and for good accepted by God committed to his will he knows and shares Christ's peace. A gift to his people to be grasped and grasped again. A gift to those whose hearts and minds are open to him. A gift realized through trust in him and obedience to him. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen. Now let us pray. Almighty God, we offer you our thanks for your word in words spoken to us in his person, incarnate, crucified, and risen. We give you thanks for his word spoken in a hand of acceptance offered to those who've fallen short. In his touch of healing to those who are sick. In his look of compassion upon those forsaken. In his word of judgment and forgiveness to those who have failed. In his acts of power for those in weakness. And so, O oh God, we commit ourselves, we dedicate what we have and what we are to prayer and to action, to working and giving, to feeding Christ's children, to tending his people, to caring for his brothers and sisters, all in whose needs we know our Lord shares. We pray for those who face hunger, thirst and poverty. And those who work to distribute the earth's good things. To harness its resources. To utilize its energy. Who carry aid in the name of Christ. Grant, O oh God, a vision of a world fairly sharing its wealth. Where want is removed and deprivation overcome. A world living in your reconciling peace. We pray for those who are restricted in mind and spirit. Stunted by ignorance, lacking in education. Imprisoned by false gods. Oppressed by harsh regimes. And for those who seek to provide learning and training and opportunity. 
and those who bring the light of the gospel and the word of life to those who desperately need to hear it. Grant, O God, a vision of a world offering hope and promise to its people. A world living in your enriching peace. We pray for those who face illness at this time, who are anxious about themselves or another, who are in mental or spiritual turmoil, bodily pain, whose relationships are wrecked by indifference or hate. We pray for those who seek to be channels of healing and reconciling in the power of Christ. And we pray for those who are facing bereavement in these days, for our sovereign lady, the Queen, and her family, in their private grief and the national family who share in a deep sense of loss and the many who have shared that same experience in these days grant O oh God a vision of a world where the broken is made complete where there is health and wholeness a world living in your saving and everlasting peace. Lead your people here and in every place to live in the light of Christ's sacrifice, to commit ourselves to its power and its triumph and making us ready to proclaim his wonderful acts, rejoicing in our call from darkness to light. Make us ready truly to be your people, having received your mercy, ready to afford that mercy to all. Hear our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn number 416. It's a modern hymn, no Greek, no Latin, just the English words, Christ is alive. Christ is alive, no longer bound to distant years in Palestine, but saving, healing, here and now, and touching every place and time. Christ is alive and comes to bring good news to this and every age till earth and sky and ocean ring with joy with justice love and praise and now may grace and mercy and peace 
from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rest and remain with each one of you and with all whom you love, now and forevermore.